And so here we see an expression for the current uh, over potential equation. So this is a little bit different form of uh, a way to study kinetics. Now why is it important that we re wrote it in this particular way? Well, initially this was a very in, in important way to write the kinetics because the previous expression for the kinetics required a value for K0 and it also required a value for the standard potential, E0, or the formal potential, E0 prime. Here you notice there is no expression for E0 in the system. What we have is eta, which is E minus E equilibrium. Very easy to measure the equilibrium potential. You just put your stuff in solution. You measure the potential at which that electrode is sitting at. And then you can change the potential versus the equilibrium potential and measure the current relationship, the current over potential relationship. And so that, this expression avoids the need to know some information such as the standard uh, oxidation potential for your couple. So initially when, before these standard oxidation potentials were available or standard reduction potentials were available in the literature, this was a very important current potential, current over potential equation. And um, basically you don't need E0 prime and that's the major uh, advantage. All right. Let me um, let me show you something on the computer, and um, see if we can pull this up. Oh, here we go. What I'm going to pull up is a uh, spreadsheet. And this particular spreadsheet is available actually to um, you as well. And that, what I'm going to do is I'm going to suggest that you look on the web page, and I, all of you now has a um, uh, email that has the address for the web page on it. And this particular one is one that's under the download section of the web page, and you can download it and play with it yourself. And this is an Excel version of the spreadsheet, but if you've got Quattro Pro for Windows, it should be able to read it, or, um, or even Quattro Pro will be able to read it. What you might see is that if you use another program like Quattro Pro, the graphs may not show up properly, so you may have to redo the graphs, but um, otherwise you'll uh, be able to manipulate it. Uh, the equations will stay the same, you won't have to worry about that. But let's take a, um, let's take our curve, and. Let's take a look. And what we can do is we can look at, on this spreadsheet, a calculation for the current potential curves. And what we can do is we can look for a situation where, let's make our rate constant very large. So this would be a, a situation where we do have essentially Nernstein behavior. And under these conditions, if we make the mass transfer coefficients essentially equal and the concentration of O and R essentially equal, alpha equal to 0.5, we can uh, see that the equilibrium potential is a very small number, four minus four times 10 to the minus 10, so essentially zero. Uh, and we can make E zero equal to zero, although we can change it to whatever we like. What we see under these conditions is that the, uh, the exchange current, using the equation we've talked about, it's in Barden Faulkner, is a value of 96.485, and that would be in amperes, just like a normal current. The limiting currents are 0.01 essentially and minus 0.01 for the two. First of all, we can look at the equation that if, assuming it's a completely a Nernstein system. And these are the curves that you would see for Nernstein behavior. In other words, for reversible behavior, no um, kinetic effects whatsoever. And this would be a mass transfer limited situation where we've included the mass transport, the mass transfer coefficients. If we look under this tab, we see a kinetic expression. And what we see here now is the net current here 
And what I've done is I've broken it down into two separate components, which is the cathodic current here and the anodic current here. And notice this. This is the E0, it's at zero point, and you can see where our I sub zero is coming from. Uh, it's the, um, it's the um, value in this particular case. Now in this particular case, the I zero is not really able to be directly shown on this graph because we've assumed a mass transfer limited situation. So the I zero is actually much, much larger than that. But you can see where the uh, cathodic and anodic branches sum together to give us our, our overall current. Let's take a situation in which uh, we've changed the rate to be somewhat smaller so that we can more easily observe this sort of an effect. Let's make our rate, let's say it's one. And let's see what happens. That's still a little high. Let's try another one. Excuse me? Oh, that didn't change it, did it? What did I change? Okay, that's a little bit better. Let's change it a little bit more, a little bit less than that. All right, now we can see a little bit more clearly the uh, exchange current density is equal to the cathodic or the anodic branches at E0. And you can see we've shown the exchange current here is about 0 .00, 0 0.009. And um, again, because of the mass transfer limitations, it's not exactly that on this particular graph. But if we excluded the mass transfer limitations, we would see that. Okay, let me, let me just continue and we'll give, come back to that in a minute. All right. The goal in this particular case, in any particular case where we're looking at the current as a function of potential is to try to get our kinetic parameters out of those current potential curves. So let's see how we can, we can understand that curve and get those numbers out of it. For example, we might plot current versus over potential uh, to get some numbers out. There's really two special cases for current versus over potential uh, plot. Uh, first case is when mass transfer is limited, is, is neglected. Okay, what happens in this particular case? Well, if mass transfer is neglected, that means that we don't have to worry about limiting the rate of the reaction by the movement of species from the bulk to the interface. The rate of mass transfer is very efficient. This might occur when you have, say, a rotating disk electrode or some sort of stirred system to bring the species to the system. Or it might occur when we've got very sluggish kinetics and the kinetics themselves are limiting the overall process. Or it can occur under, very, under situations where we're at very small fractions of the limiting current. And so generally, when I is much, much less than the limiting current, we can get this particular case uh, to be reasonably accurate. In other words, I, as an example, might be uh, less than a tenth of the limiting current, and we would get these sorts of situations. If that's the case, then the oxidized, the solution, the concentration of species O at the electrode surface and the bulk concentration are pretty similar. They're nearly one, they're nearly unity, and so we can actually ignore those uh, concentrations and write down a, an expression for that. And there we go. And this particular basic, this particular equation assumes uh, O and R present and soluble. Um, we've, we've made that assumption a lot. That's not always the case for 
electrochemical reactions where the both species are soluble. But for now, we're just assuming soluble species. Uh, both are present, and um, that species O uh, is essentially equal to C sub O in the bulk, uh, and vice versa, C sub R at the electrode surface is essentially equal to C sub R in the bulk. And then, like I said, that would happen when we've got a stirred solution. This particular equation is called the Butler-Vollmer equation. Named for, you know, electrochemists, the physical chemists that initially wrote this down. And uh, we can actually simulate this on our, ex on our spreadsheet. And so let's try to do that. Let's make, to do that, and I encourage you, and in fact, I strongly encourage you to download this and spend some time adjusting the concentrations, mass transfer coefficients, alpha, k0, see what happens when all these things vary. And I think you'll find it pretty informative. Let's change our mass transfer coefficients to be very large. Let's suppose they're a, a, a thousand. So we're not, we're actually really still simulating or using the equations without making these assumptions, but we can, we can get in a form that would be very similar to that equation there. Let's look at our uh, kinetically limited current now. Um, what we've got is a curve now when we've got large mass transfer coefficients and fairly slow kinetics is something that looks like this. And you can see the current here is very large. It's 100 amps on the, for the cathodic limiting current and a minus 100 amps for the anodic limiting current. So really what we're interested in is that little bit down here where we've, we're gonna look at this particular point. And so what we can do is blow this up so that we're getting a, a value close to the uh, exchange current density, which is still 0.01 about. So let's change the scale on here to get that sort of information. So let's make it minus 0.02 and this one 0.02 and let's see what we get. All right. And let's change our scale on this axis also so that we can see a little bit more clearly. Let's make it minus 300 to plus 300 on the scale. Whoops, let's change that back. Not minus 300, we want minus 0.3 and plus 0.3. All right, here we go. Okay, so we're just looking at a little bit of that. For, remember, it looked kind of it looked like two ways, but actually, right at the intersection, you can see what we're seeing here. We can see uh, now the exchange current density is very close to 0.01 as we expect, and you can see that the, at equilibrium, the current goes to zero as it has to. But you can see it's composed of those two things, and that's a very small fraction of the overall uh, total current that flows. So the exchange current density is is showing us that way. So this would be a situation when we have a fairly small uh, exchange current density. Let's go back and make our uh, kinetics a little bit faster. So if we go back to our calculation screen and change the kinetics by, say, a factor of 10, and we go back and look at the curve, now what do we see? Well, we see now that the curves now are much Larger and they've gone off scale essentially. And you can see that in that intersection region, the curves are almost vertical. Now it, we haven't really changed the scale, so if we replotted it, it would look it wouldn't look much different. But uh, you can see that just by changing that, we've changed the the exchange current density. If we change and go back to much lower kinetics, or maybe a factor, go from one to 0.01. We can see now, again, the exchange current density has dropped, again, dramatically. And uh, we can see that the, the uh, curves are starting to separate some. And if we go even more of a uh, K0, those will, will uh, 
spread out quite a bit more. And you can see as we increase the or decrease the kinetics, those curves, and you can see right at the equilibrium, there's very little current flowing, exchange current flowing, so that means it would be very sluggish at achieving equilibrium in this particular case. There's no idle speed on this system that will let us easily achieve equilibrium because the current that flows, remember, is a rate of, of chemical change. And so the low currents means low rate of chemical change, low achievement of equilibrium. Let's take a look at something else that happens. Let's suppose we change the value of alpha. Remember alpha is usually 0.5. Let's change it to 0.7. Okay, look now what happens to our curves. The curves now have become very asymmetric. And that asymmetry is reflective of the fact that we've changed the, um, we've changed how that curve looks. And you can see that we've changed to 0.7 and notice the cathodic branch has increased more rapidly than the anodic branch. So that suggests that the, that's our asymmetry. Now if we go back to our calculation, you see the cathodic branch achieved more rapidly than the anodic. If we go back to our calculation and look at alpha of um, 0.3, the opposite will occur. The anodic branch now occurs to, to occur much more rapidly, increases much more rapidly than the anodic, or the, uh, than the um, cathodic branch. So you can see with the effect of alpha and the effect of the, of the uh, value of the exchange current or the K0 effect. This, that would be a situation where we've got very low mass transfer situations. And we can look, if we look at that part of the curve, in fact, let's blow it up a little bit more. I don't know if we'll get much more able to blow it up, but let's see if we can. Right near the intersection, that curve is, you can see for about 10 millivolts, well that's about 20 millivolts there to positive 20 millivolts, minus 20 millivolts to positive 20 millivolts. Let's blow it up a little bit more. You can see it's very close to a straight line. In fact, it doesn't look very straight there, but especially if alpha is close to 0.5, it's easier to see that. And you can see it's nearly a straight line there. And so there is a region of the curve where we have, we can actually break that down our curve into different different types of things. Um, so let's consider three regions of our current over potential curve. One is when eta is essentially zero close to it, or eta is large at positive potentials and eta is large at negative potentials. And so we've got three regions of the situation. If eta is large uh, and at the absolute value, either large, positive, or negative, this is the region they call a Tafel region. Tafel was an electrochemist that was interested, an early, early person that was interested in electrode kinetics. And he saw that if we took that large current over potential curve, we could actually make it into a, a plot by applying the uh, logarithms of the situation. Um, and so basically Tafel said that it, for anodic situations, um, the current is approximately equal to the cathodic branch of the part of the expression, I sub C, and that would be equal to E minus alpha NF uh, eta. In other words, we can break down our current voltage expression into parts. And when uh, we've got large over potentials, the back reaction basically is negligible. So just we're looking at, say, the forward reaction. And vice versa for the cathodic process, we can say that, well, that's anodic, so I meant to say, um, uh, we've got cathodic process, I sub C is equal to E to the one minus alpha NF N. Again, 
we've got a uh, situation where we've got such a large overpotential that we don't really have to consider the reverse kinetic process. In other words, um, uh, KF and KB uh, at sufficiently extreme potentials, we only have to consider the forward process or the reverse process. Taffel said, let's uh, take the logarithms of those, and uh, the logarithm of I sub C uh, is equal to the natural log of the exchange current minus alpha NF RT, NF big F over RT um, eta. And the natural log of I sub A is equal to the natural log of the exchange current. And uh, well, you can use log. Or, I, I think he was using, I'm not sure, he probably, since that was a long time ago, he probably used logs. So let's write them as logs, not natural logs. And um, in, that, in that case, we would have a factor of 2.3 RT in there. Why we convert from natural logs to logs, we'll have that factor of 2.3 in there. And so he then said, well, let's make this plot into a, a what they call a Tafel plot. And um, what he saw was a curve that looked something like this, where we see a cathodic and anodic branch for the two systems, and then this would be an overpotential. Again, remember, overpotential is just the shift from the equilibrium point, and it doesn't. Re Taffel plots do not require knowledge of the of the standard potential. Uh, kind of an old-fashioned way of doing it. And if you look at the intersection of these two points, they're straight lines. As it gets close to zero, it becomes less linear. But that point right there would be the exchange current or the natural log of the, or log of the exchange current in this particular case. And so this would be log of I, and actually log of the absolute value of I, obviously. And so this branch, the cathodic branch, would be alpha NF over RT, and this anodic branch would be, um, well, what am I, I this should be uh, one minus alpha here. Sorry about that. And this, this branch would be um, 1 minus alpha NF over RT. So by looking at the Taffel plot, you can get the uh, alpha values from the slope of this curve, and you can get, in principle, the exchange current uh, on the system. Why do I show this as leveling off? Well, this would be what they call the mass transfer region. And every electrode reaction will ultimately be limited by the rate of mass transfer. So in this region here, the Tafel region, where we get a logarithmic dependence on the current as a function of overpotential, that's the region where we can extract kinetics. As we increase the potential further and further, we'll get to a point where the kinetics are becoming very rapid because of the potential effect, and we get into the limitation by mass transfer. And so diffusion rate or stirring will kick in, and we'll get no longer will we get any information about the kinetics, just information about the mass transfer rate. So in order to uh, get good Tafel plots, we need to have slow kinetics, basically, S small values of K0 or I0, or we need to have very uh, large um, mass transfer coefficients, M sub O, M sub R. Now let's take a look at 
a TAFL plot that we can plot on the computer. And let's see how that looks. We've taken, we've got a situation here where we've got very large mass transfer coefficients and our uh, exchange current is quite small and our, uh, and our, so our TAFL plot should actually look very similar to what we expect. We get the cath anodic and cathodic branches for the logarithm. Uh, if you look here, the over potential is uh, quite, there's a quite large TAFL region because we've got a very high mass transfer rates. Much larger, in fact, than you could actually achieve naturally. So let's achieve, let's put our uh, mass transfer rates to more normal type ones. And our, our mass transfer rates might be uh, maybe one centimeter per second would be a somewhat typical mass transfer rates. K0, would be, this would be about as fast as you could probably easily measure using the TAFL plot method. But if we look at our TAFL plot, we can see now the, um, we get kind of a funny uh, thing here. Let's uh, change our mass transfer coefficient. so that doesn't show up there. There's better. Right. And you can see now our TAFL region, as we change the mass transfer coefficient, has dropped dramatically. We've got much less part of that curve that would be the logarithmic part. And so as we change the mass transfer coefficient, we can, and we can see, that fat, see that effect. Let's investigate now, and you can see, unfortunately this is kind of a, You can see that our over potential is about to out to 500, plus and minus 500 millivolts on, that, on this particular system. Let's change our rate constant now to be much slower. Uh, let's go down to say 10 to the minus six. And you can see now our, our uh, TAFL region is much larger. You can see as we go close to zero, zero over potentials are, are, um, it again deviates from a linear behavior. What should happen when we change alpha? Well, alpha is a, a slope term here, so we, if we change alpha, go back here and change alpha to say something else, let's make it uh, 0.7 again. You can see now what happens. We've made the alpha 0.7, and the slope you can see that obviously has shifted in that particular case. And so it'd be quite obvious to you. Oops, lost my lost my mic here for a second. Should be quite obvious to you when you're doing the experiment. You'd see that see that effect. Now, of course, your data wouldn't be nearly as good as this. Uh, you, this is a, a calculation, but it would be somewhat similar. You can see some examples of real TAFL data in your book. Uh, let's change a few other things. Let's suppose our mass transfer coefficient uh, becomes slightly uh, asymmetric as well. We can say make a one mass transfer coefficient equal to two. What happens to our TAFL plot? Let's um, change our calculus. Let's send your alpha back to 5.5. Let's make it not quite two, let's make it one and a half. So we've changed the mass transfer coefficient for O to 1.5, our mass transfer for the uh, R1 centimeter per second. Let's change our K0, 10 to the minus six, alpha 0.5. Okay, what's happened here? Well you can see probably very barely though, because it's a logarithmic scale, that there is a, a slight difference in the mass transfer coefficients but the slopes are essentially the same. And so in this particular case, we don't have to worry about the slopes, we just have to worry about the, uh, uh, whether or not we'll be able to get into a TAFL region. What happens if we're trying to measure kinetics that are much more rapid than, or close to the value of the mass transfer coefficients? Let's make our uh, rate of electron transfer 0.1, so we're 10 times 
slower rate than mass transfer coefficients. Remember, in order to see anything kinetically, we have to have a slower rate of electron transfer than a rate of mass transport. Uh, now what you can see now is that our Taffa plot really doesn't have any linear parts to it. it um, you do sort of see what you'd expect to see, but the linearity is really gone. So you'd be very hard pressed to extract any kinetic parameters out of this particular plot. So what would you have to do? Well, you either have to look for something that's slower or try to increase the mass transfer coefficient somehow. And we can, if, so suppose we make our mass transfer coefficient 10 times larger than it was. Now, still not great, but we probably have some linearity here that we could extract some, some, some data in. We, we wouldn't be very um, pleased with the results, but we could probably make some pretty good guess of the, of the rate constant. Let me show you one more thing about our, um, now we've, we've changed this expression around. Let's change our uh, scale back so that we can get the, data back on the screen here. Uh, cancel that. Can't get the. Uh, let's try this again. Okay, here we go. So here's our um, curve now in a non taffel plot. It would just be the normal current versus potential here. Uh, you don't really see the anodic and cathodic branches now because they're very small. What you can see here with slow kinetics and relatively fast mass transport rates is that you would see a, a shift. We'd see a, a, a basically a, a distinct cathodic part of that curve and a distinctly anodic part of the curve. And that occurs because we've got both CO and CR present in the system. Uh, we don't have to have both CO and CR present in the system. We can make, for example, let's make our reduced species to be quite small, 10 to the minus 9, and now look at our curve. This would be the curve that we would expect to see under those conditions. So, uh, there's just a single branch of the curve. And if we change, uh, let's say, alpha, what will happen is that curve will shift. And you probably might, you might remember the curve was a little bit skewed that way with alpha 0.5. Now with alpha 0.75, it's a little bit sharper. If we go back to alpha 0.25, then we should see a significant effect. And you can see now the curve is less sharp, doesn't rise as quickly, and there again there's the effect of alpha in this particular case. So we can use this spreadsheet to investigate not only when O and R are both present, but when O and R are present by themselves, so by using appropriately small values of the rate, of the uh, concentrations. All right, how are we doing?
And so there are, when we talk about electrode reaction, we often talk about three particular cases of electrode reactions. We talk about reversible, quasi-reversible, and irreversible. Reversible is a situation where we can essentially assume that the electrode reaction is Nernstein. In other words, we can assume that we've got um, reversible process, uh, no deviations from equilibrium, no significant deviations from equilibrium. Uh, under most conditions, it's very difficult to get mass transfer coefficients above perhaps even a tenth of a centimeter per second, although sometimes you can. So K0 is greater than 1 are often considered to be essentially reversible processes. So just as a general guideline, K0 greater than 1 is considered to be reversible, although again, it would depend a lot on your mass transfer coefficient. Uh, K0 is, say, from 0 0.1 to 10 to the minus 4 or 5 would be, it's considered quasi-reversible. It has features that are a mixture between uh, our Nernstein case and what we call the irreversible case, where K0 would be less than uh, 10 to the minus 6 or so. An important feature of irreversible kinetics is that we can consider both branches of the cathodic and anodic waves as separate from each other. And I think we can illustrate that, again, by looking at our computer program to illustrate those three situations. Let's go back to our calculation for uh, spreadsheet and let's make our C sub O equal to C sub R again. Let's make alpha equal to a 0.5 again. And let's make K0 equal to be a very large value. Let's make it a thousand. And let's change our mass transfer coefficients back to some reasonable values, let's say 1. And uh, 1.01. Oh, one. What we can see is that if we look at a curve that we would call Nernstein, and this is in fact a curve that will always be Nernstein, it just takes a look at our uh, mass transfer coefficients to get the proper shape, is that. And if we look at our kinetic curve, uh, the potential scale is a little bit different, but you can see the curve will be essentially uh, in this shape. I don't like those large excursions of potentials. Let's make it. Uh, let's make it like this. And you can see the curve is very sharp. Uh, it really would look like that as long as the mass transfer coefficients don't change, the concentrations don't change, it doesn't really matter what the K0 is. If we go back and make our K0 equal to uh, uh, 100 instead of 1,000, really we're not going to see any difference in the shape of the wave because we're not limited by kinetics whatsoever. Let's change our kinetics now to be a little bit slower. Let's make it equal to our mass transfer coefficient, 1. Now what happens? Uh, you can probably notice that the curve is not as sharp as it was. Not as sharp as it was. And that's an indication that we're starting to have some incorporation of a kinetic effect. Here would be first indication of a quasi-reversible behavior. If we go a little bit slower, again, 0.1, uh, still in the quasi-reversible behavior. Notice now we can see sort of a dis break now as those two branches begin to separate. And let's go to um, K0 of say 10 to the minus uh, 6 or so. And now we can see essentially irreversible behavior. Those two branches are completely separated and this is kind of a nice situation for studying kinetics because you can easily distinguish those two kinetic processes and you don't have to consider the forward and the reverse reaction, so it's a simple, simpler kinetic process. One other thing about alpha values, let's go back and look at alpha again. I, I want to make it very clear what's happening. Let's put alpha 
0.45 in this particular case. Uh, that's not very clear. Let's make it a little bit more clear. Here at alpha of 0.4, what's happened? You can see that alpha 0.4, the cathodic branch has become less steep than the anodic branch. Also, very importantly, the, the point which is halfway between those two waves is no longer essentially at zero. It shifted over to this, you know, this side of the curve. If you carefully examine that, you'll see that. So the difference between those two waves is not zero, which not which in the E0 should be zero. So that's an interesting effect. But if we go back to uh, our kinetically limited case, a quasi-reversible case, say 0.1, um, you can still see a, an effect of alpha. You can see that's a little bit less sharp than that one, but um, the point is, is much closer. We're nearly equivalent. The, the difference between those two waves is uh, near to zero. If we go and make our K0 much faster again, let's say a 10, our curve no longer really depends on alpha. In fact, the reason it doesn't depend on alpha is anymore because we no longer have any kinetic effects. So we can change alpha to be just about any value. Uh, let's make it 0.1. And you can see that the exchange current, or the branches of the curves are much, much affected by that, but the net overall current is no longer affected by that, and you don't really have any effect on the wave whatsoever. But obviously, if we make the kinetics slow again, let's make it, let's make it 0.1. Uh, you can see that alpha 0.1 is very, um, uh, clearly causes a problem on the, on the wave. So. Um, Alpha it really only enters into the situation when we have to worry about um, kinetics. So as we get to quasi-reversible, irreversible, we have to worry about alpha and K0. All right, one other thing to think about in our electrode reactions we haven't considered was the um, situation where eta is approximately zero. And in this particular case, we can linearize the Butler-Volmer equation. And we can use the relationship that e to the x is approximately equal to 1 plus x for small x. And in that case, then the current, if we linearize the process, is equal to the exchange current times nf eta. All right. And eta over I is equal to um, RT over NF exchange current. And uh, that actually is basically equal to a uh, term that we often refer to as the charge transfer resistance. It's called a charge transfer resistance because it has the same units as resistance does. Um, this is a potential or voltage. This is a current. So just like Ohm's law, uh, if we have a voltage over a current, we get a resistor. And that's a resistance. And that's what we're seeing here. And so by measuring the current flow for very small potential excursions around the over potential, we get a, an expression for the charge transfer resistance. And using that charge transfer resistance is a direct measure of the facility for electron transfer processes. So what some people do and still do is sit at the equilibrium potential and use very small uh, excursions from um, the equilibrium point and measure effectively resistance. And that's the resistance then is proportional to the exchange current. And then that's proportional to the uh, K0. Um, as you might expect, uh, RCT goes to uh, zero for large K0. Does never approach, is never is exactly zero, but it's uh, uh, close to zero for very large values. And you can, I put in an expression for the exchange current, or the rate 
charge transfer resistance in that spreadsheet as well, and you can see the effect of the charge transfer resistance. For very slow kinetics, it gets very large. It gets very uh, large, and that means that it's very difficult to pass current through that system. Um, and if you plot the current versus over potential at that, in that linear region, we get uh, basically a straight line for small over potentials. And you can see that again by when you blow up that little region, that's a basically a linear line. All right. All right, so we've talked about ways to measure the resistance, charge transfer resistance. We've done it in a very semi-empirical way. We've used a semi-empirical relationship. We've used a parameterized expression for the uh, kinetics and so on. And this is what I want to leave you with. This is a, although somewhat old-fashioned, this is about 50 or 60 years old treatment of the rate constant. It's still quite useful. And so using butler volmer formulation will get you quite a bit uh, of the way into understanding electrode kinetics.